Welcome back to Bible House. And it's been a while, right? Uh, I was worried this, uh, this afternoon, and even at about 7.20, I was uh, worried that some, some of you might have forgotten about today. Uh, but you are here, and at about 7.35, uh, this room started to fill up, and I said, God, you are good. <laughs> Reminded us. Uh, after today's lecture, we will have another, another quite long break until the 12th of July. And uh, our next meeting will be the 12th of July, just to let you know. But in between, if you would like to uh, hear more about uh, of the History of Redemption Series lectures, uh, we do have ongoing History of Redemption Series lectures at the church that where I'm serving at which is Zion Church on Upper Thompson, uh, uh, Tower Lane. And so uh, if you would like to come by on Sundays, we even have shuttle service from Bishan MRT uh, in the morning. So if, you, if you're interested, find anybody in the back behind the table. They will let you know the, the uh, detailed information. But uh, without further, further uh, house uh, announcements. Uh, I'd like to get into our studies for today, where we are starting and beginning the, uh, the uh, contents in the second book in the History of Redemption series. Can somebody hold up that book in the back, please? The second book. And that is the second book, and the cover is really Mount Sinai. Uh, we we purchased the uh, we actually purchased the picture from a professional photographer in Israel, and it's the top of Mount Sinai, and uh, you can see a little bit of the pillar of clouds in the distance. That's real cloud, also. Uh, uh, the title for the uh, the the book is Covenant of the Torch. Uh, Covenant of the Torch is one of the covenants, one of the seven covenants that God gave to Abraham. And uh, this is in Genesis chapter 15. So we will read Genesis chapter 15 first. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet come. Uh, this is the actual covenant that God made to Abraham. And this, God, uh, God made Abraham when Abraham was 84 years old. And this is uh, much before the Exodus, but this is prophesying about the, the, uh, the Egypt and uh, the uh, Israel's slavery in Egypt. They will be oppressed 400 years. And then they will, uh, God will judge that nation, you know, ten plagues, and they will come out with many possessions. And when they actually came out, they came out with many possessions. Uh, they, God gave grace upon the Egyptians, and when the Israelites asked for things, they were not hesitant in giving it out to them during the Exodus. And, as, and Abraham also lived a good old age, and verse 16, then, in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So, he said God is uh, telling Abraham about the, what will happen in the future. And this is the Exodus and the wilderness journey. How the Israelites will return to Canaan. Okay? And so let us take a look at the journey here. From today to the next time, today we have two lectures, and next time we have two lectures. So altogether four lectures will be in this wilderness. Are you ready? 
They, it took 40 years for the Israelites to get through this wilderness. It will take us four lectures to get through it. What a deal, right? What a deal. But before we get on to this, let me ask you if you want to actually get on to this journey. Would you like to? Or are you already in this journey? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, first, uh, if you look, this is a map in, that's in, included in the book. And this is a map that Reverend Rampart, who is the author of the History of Memphis series, has made. And many, many, many archaeologists and uh, renowned scholars, uh, Old Testament scholars, have seen this map and they said this is, uh, this is the only map that has so many details and also has all 42 campsites pointed out in the whole world. You can look at religious atlas and different, different reference books. They do not have 42 campsites. But more than that, what I personally I think is important is that this map is not just a map of Israel's exodus journey, okay, wilderness journey. This is a map of my life. This is a map of your life. Furthermore, this is a map that prophesies about Jesus' life. I'll show you a little bit of that today. But this map, uh, Exodus and Wilderness Journey, the, the entire event that contains so many events, such as Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments, the Tabernacle, the Ten Plagues, the Feasts, the, the, the Festival Days to Remember, uh, Parting of the Red Sea, water gushing out from the rock, Jordan River parting, wars, and so on, right? And these are all things that really actually take place in our life journey once we come into the wilderness. And Acts chapter 7 verse 38, I'll turn to Acts chapter 7 verse 38. Acts chapter 7 verse 38, it says, This is the one who was in the congregation. In Greek, it's ecclesia. Okay? Meaning church. In the wilderness. Together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai. So, it's, uh, this is Deacon Stephen preaching. And he is comparing the wilderness to the church. So, are you in the wilderness already? Amen. Whether you have you knew or not, you are already in the wilderness. I'm sorry. So this wilderness journey has, uh, especially Reverend Abraham Park's map has. Uh, can you see this? Okay. One through forty-two campsites <coughs> divided into these journeys. No, uh, I'm sorry. These five courses of journey. Okay? First journey from Ramses to the wilderness of Sinai. Okay? That is when they first came out of uh, Egypt and they're experiencing, in experiencing the wilderness life for the first time. And you can think about when you first came out of your Egypt, which is the world, Revelation chapter 11 verse 8 tells us, that Egypt is like the sinful world that crucified Jesus. And therefore, Egypt, your Egypt, is the world before you came to Jesus Christ. But as, so when we first came, started to attend church, started to believe in Jesus, started to walk with Jesus, when you were at it for the first time, were you good at it? We were amateurs. We were, we were, Many things were very foreign to us. Many things we had to get adjusted to. So that's what's happening from Ramses to the wilderness of Sinai. They're meeting and they're experiencing. Do you experience that uh, hair standing, miraculous, you know, personal feeling more when you first believe, start to believe in Jesus or after 10 years? 
<laughs> no, that's why we say we need to go back to our first love, right? And this is where most of these miracles and amazing things happen. And then the second second course of journey is from the wilderness of Sinai to Rithma. Still, still in the beginning stage. And still God's doing, God's showing them. But they are growing up. They're now getting used to. And then, after that, from Rithma back to Kadesh. Okay? So, wilderness of Sinai. At the wilderness of Sinai, God basically uh, educates them. Through the, God gives them the law, the teachings, gives them the tabernacle, gives them, uh, makes them into a, an army basically. A take census of the men who are able to go out to war, basically take number of soldiers, okay? And make them into a nation. So they are settled, they are stabilized, and they are ready to go on. God tells Israel to go up to Rithma, which is Kadesh, which is very close to Canaan, and God tells them to go in. But something happens. They do not go in. And so, although they knew, although they knew God and they were supposed to obey God, they didn't, and therefore, as a result, journey from Kadesh or Rithma all the way back to Kadesh. Basically, coming back to the same place after how many years of wandering around in the wilderness? 38 years. Okay? And then, after they repented, they learned, and second generation, they are starting from Kadesh, now to Gilgal. Gilgal is the 42nd campsite. So, we'll, take a, we'll get on this journey together. And uh, one thing I'd like to ask you to remember, let us not think of this as a his, uh, history lesson. I mean, if, you're, if you want to study history, I suggest that you go study Singaporean history, <laughs> not some other nation's history. This is Israel history, right? Okay. But we are studying this because this is your history, my history. This is the history of Jesus Christ. How He came to this world. So, um, let us think about that. But let me ask you, uh, who wants to, I, I already asked you, who wants to get into this wilderness journey? We were already in. I said I'm sorry. But, let me rephrase that question. Why are you in this journey? What's your aim? Where are you trying to go to? Huh? The promised land, yes. Oh, I almost forgot the promised land. Okay? We're trying to get to the promised land. What's so special about the promised land that you so want to go? You leave your old, good old life and, and this wilderness is not a comfortable place. You know, you're living as a Christian in this world is not a very easy thing. Many sacrifices, many sufferings, many hurts and afflictions, right? What's so special about this Canaan land that you want to go? Because God told me. Because I'm just born in this wilderness. I don't know where else to go. Some of us are born in the wilderness. We're like the second generation. We're born into a Christian family and I have no choice. My dad, mom and dad go to church, they forced me to go to church, and now I'm used to it. I don't know where else to go. I feel weird if I don't go to church. Is that why? Is that why? And now Egypt, Egypt won't accept me anymore. All right. Is that why? So let us think about this first hour, the uh, first uh, session. Let us think about why Canaan. Okay. We read this now. Okay. This this entire thing is a is a prophecy that God made to, or basically a promise that God made to Abraham, the father of faith. Okay. And so let us go back to Genesis chapter 15 and think about what God really wanted to say to Abraham when he was making that covenant. Okay. 
So Genesis chapter 15 again. But we'll read from a little before. Okay. See, from verse 1, God appears to Abraham and God makes a promise about the son. So Abraham is saying, God, I, I have no heir, not, no son, so I'm going to, to give, uh, make my slave, Eliezer, into my heir, my, my, you know, the one to inherit everything that I have. And God says, no. And he takes him outside, verse 5. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And so, God speaks about this land all of a sudden. Okay? So, Canaan, why Canaan? First, it's part of God's covenant. We'll continue on reading. He says, I am the one that brought you out of the, the order of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. God all of a sudden changed his subject from talking about the sun to the land. Do you see? And he said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will bless it? This is Abraham. Remember, God said to Abraham, I will give you a son. And he, he, he promised him something that is inconceivable, unbelievable, incredible. He said, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. Do you know how many stars there are in the sky? Billions and billions, right? Can you, would you be able to believe this? Just because God said? Right? Which is easier to believe here? I don't know. God says, I'll give you this land versus I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. Land is something that you can see. It's possible. But Abraham believed the opposite way. Abraham believed about the sons. But all of a sudden God says, I'll give you this land as a promise. Or as a as uh, of the promised land, I give you this land to possess it. And Abraham asks this time. He did not just believe. He says, how may I know that I will possess it? I'm thinking, is it easier to believe something that is so big that you cannot even conceive? But something like the land, you actually need to see a document. God, can you, can you, can I, can you bring me the document? Let me sign it first. So that's why God says, bring me uh, uh, all these animals, and he, wants, he says, I'll make a covenant with you. And so we read verses 13 through 16, and verse 17, at the end of this promises that God, God made, it says, it came about when the sun had said that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. This is why it's called the covenant of the torch. Now, what God had told Abraham was, cut these animals into pieces. Okay? So, kill the animals, cut, it, cut them into two pieces. And so this, this area where he put all these animals, one by one, side by side, half by half, is quite bloody here, right? Cut them into two pieces. <clears throat> and this is a, a well-known treaty process during that time, okay? We, we, do, we do it with ink when we make a contract. How do we make a contract when you buy something? I sign it, you sign it, and I get a copy, you get a copy. 
right? I paid the money. <laughs> and if you and it has a date, you know, you know, for my for, for example, if for my rental, I have to I have to live here until for if I made a two-year contract, I have to live here until then. If I want to move out, I have to pay extra. You know, there's a penalty. What they're saying is cut into two pieces, and they have to go pass in between the two pieces. My party and your party. I go and you go. And whoever breaks this covenant will become like this. That's what it means. Okay? I break it, I get cut into two pieces. Okay? But here, the torch represents the presence of God. A flaming torch. Did Abraham ever walk in between? No. It's only God goes. God says, this is a unilateral covenant. It's a like one-way covenant. I make the promise with you. I will be responsible to fulfill it. I give my life to fulfill it. And he really did give his life. Jesus came to fulfill that. But the actual promise, the, the content of the covenant, is son or descendants and land. What God is trying to do, oh, thank you. Is not for his benefit. It's mainly for the for the sake of fulfilling his redemptive work. He makes covenant with us. There is no benefit for him, but it it is to re restore mankind from the fall. So it is closely related. God's covenants are closely re related to redemption. And from the Garden of Eden, people were lost. Remember, God, uh, I, I said this many times, but in, in order to establish a kingdom or a nation, you need people, you need territory, land, and you need law or sovereignty. God is trying to reestablish through Abraham people. He says, I hope, me, I hope you will be the father of many people, multitudes of nations. Land. He says, I will make you a pro promise that you will possess this land. And on the way, and in there, you will obey me, obey, obey my word. Sovereignty is restored. Obedience. To God's word. So he wants to find people who will obey the word of God and put them into the promise. Do you think when God called Abraham, where was Abraham living when God called him? Ur of the Chaldeans, right? But we learned in the first book, okay, he was also living on, in one more place right before he came to Canaan. He went from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran and then to Canaan. Right? Now, when Abraham was living in Ur of the Chaldeans, do you think he would have wanted to come to Canaan? Which is more developed during that time? You're saying, you're asking me? <laughs> I've never lived there. <laughs> Of course, Ur of the Chaldeans, more developed, more culture. His parents were there, his family settlement was, was there. Okay. What about Haran? Even better. 
you know, his believing ancestors were there, his relatives were there. Those two places were well-known, wealthy, well-to-do areas. But Canaan, who heard about Canaan back then? Right? And let us think about the name Canaan. Why is God so stuck with this land? He could have said, go to, I don't know, Singapore. <laughs> the good land. But he said Canaan. He kept us, he did not change his mind. Why? But think about the name. Is it attractive, not the name itself? Canaan. To us now, Canaan seems very attractive because we always equate Canaan to promised land, Canaan promised land. But to Adam and Abraham, living in Ur of the Chaldeans, who is Canaan? Let us turn to Genesis chapter 9. This is the incident where after the flood, okay, chapter 9, verse 1, we'll read. Chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons, and this is after the flood, right? He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Oh, yeah. Apologize for that. Can you still see? Okay. Verse 1, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Where have you heard this before? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. When God finished his creation, created Adam and Eve, and he blessed them in the Garden of Eden. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Now, the... the the land was covered with sin, and God judged and wiped out all the sinful ones, and only Noah's family remained. And after the flood, God gave the same blessing. This is like the new beginning here. And after that, Noah had a vineyard, and he got drunk from the wine from the vineyard. And he slept naked, and his son Ham saw the nakedness, verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his, of his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both of both their shoulders, and walked backward, and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces. of their father, and their faces were turned away, so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew that his youngest son had, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. What did he do? What did he do? Is it a sinful thing for a son to see his father's nakedness? Is it so simple that Shem and Japheth had to walk backwards, make sure that they don't see the nakedness? And then he says, verse 25, So he said, Cursed be Canaan! All of a sudden? Why did he curse Canaan? Who is Canaan? Who's the one that saw the nakedness here? Why did he say, Cursed be Ham? He said, Cursed be Canaan, Ham's fourth son. Okay. Servant of all servants, and so on and so on. Do you ever wonder, why did Noah? And so, there are two schools of thought here. Schools of, uh, two, two, uh, two uh, views on this. 
And first is a popular belief that it's Noah's fault that he got drunk and cursed because you know he got mad that his son saw his nakedness. But the the it's missing. Uh, it can be. It it is partly true. Okay? To let you know ahead of the time, I I partially agree with both views. Uh, I think they're both wrong. I mean, I mean, not the views. I think they both did something wrong. Noah and Ham. Uh, but the question is, is the drinking matter the issue here? Is that the main issue? Getting drunk on the wine, is that the main issue? Sleeping one day and just you know, made a mistake and got drunk. Okay. Second view is sorry for sorry for branching out this story, but trust me, it has something to do with the main story. <laughs> Second view is this naked seeing the nakedness matter. And why did Noah curse Canaan? Let us. According to this view. Numbers, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 20, verse, 12, uh, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 12, 20, verse 11. If there is a man who lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. Okay. So according to the Hebrew thought, Okay. Seeing the father's nakedness is sleeping with his father's wife. I don't know if that's what it means in Genesis chapter 9. Okay. But seeing that Canaan is cursed, could it be? It's a big question. I'm not here to teach you that part of the Bible, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is just like in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they began very nicely. God said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And God said to keep the garden. But they let the serpent come in and talk to them and break up the family. It's supposed to be a family of faith, Adam and Eve, Serpent came in and broke up the family. What? Why? The reason why I say both Noah and Ham is are at fault is because they let some kind of sin. I don't know what it is. Getting drunk or or the nakedness of the father. I don't know what it is. But something came in to that family. They let that sin come in. Broke up the family. I gave this sermon uh, at my church uh, a few weeks ago. God is the God of the family. God begins with the family, and Satan attacks the family first. And God starts and begins His redemptive work from a family too. I pray that your family, I don't know, today there are many broken families, but I pray that from you, the redemptive work will begin. I pray that God will save your family too. God considers this family value very, very important and, and upholds it very high. Anyway, this is Canaan. To Abraham's thinking, Canaan is the cursed man and the land of Canaan who is living there. The cursed people. And Abraham is whose descendant? Shem, Ham, Japheth. Shem's descendant, right? And the Canaanites are Ham's descendants. Let's say, for example, God says, going there is my will, and that place 
is full of your enemies. The people that you don't really want to mix with. The people that you don't even want to talk to. The people that you don't think you... I'd rather go to a different country than to talk to that guy. God says, that is the place that I promised you. I'll give you that land. Abraham's thinking, God, I don't really want that land. It's, it's, do I you really need to go there? Haran? Very comfortable. Or of the Chaldeans? Hey, it's okay to live. That's the kind of land Canaan is. It's the land that God promised, the land occupied by the wrong people. Oftentimes in the Bible, land, uh, you can think about the parable of the soil. The land represents the heart of people. The land promised to God can be your heart. Our heart. Mankind. Where we live. And because of the fall of mankind, the wrong owners take possession of the land. Remember God said, because of your sins, the ground is cursed and will produce thorns and thistles. Try, have you ever tried to evangelize people? Easy or not easy? 99% of the time it's not easy. Why? Because their hearts are filled with something else already. Right? Our hearts are filled with the, the Canaanites already. And Matthew chapter 15 verse 19 tells us how many tribes in Canaan? How many tribes in Canaan? Not two. Seven tribes in Canaan, right? No? Seven? Is it? Am I confused? Yeah, thank you. Seven tribes. Should we turn to Matthew chapter 15? For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. These are the seven tribes in our, in our heart. And this has to do with the Ten Commandments of all, of course. And Jesus was, uh, after that, Jesus came to the Canaanite woman. I don't know if that's quite coincidence. Occupied by the wrong people. Kind of Canaan land kind of reminds us of the Garden of Eden. It's the land that God gave to his people, but his people are kicked out and cannot come into it. But they need to return to it. Just like God made a prophecy through the covenant of the torch with Abraham. Your people belong here, but they, they will be sent out to the foreign nation. They will suffer. They will be oppressed. Just like mankind after getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But they will return. And so returning to the land of Canaan is like us returning to the Garden of Eden. So Abraham was to go not as a choice and preference of which country or which area he wants to live in, right? Not according to school district, but because of redemption. Abraham had to go there for the sake of God's work of redemption. Would you go to the place like Canaan for the sake of redemption, for the sake of God's work? And third, it's a land. This is the most important before we 
actually embarked on the journey. We haven't started yet. This is a, you know, when we go somewhere and travel, the travel agency person comes out and gives you all the instructions and, it, and this is what you, this is, this is it. After the break, we, we will start now. Get on the bus. Okay. I'm introducing to you the land that we have to go to, right? Canaan. Can, this, is, this is the most important point about Canaan. It's a land where you have to look up. What do you mean? What was the incentive when the Israel and when Moses came to the Israelites and they said, what, 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 you're gonna lead us out to where? What? Canaan, your father's land. Your, the land that God promised to Father Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. What, what place is that? And he said, it's the place flowing with milk and honey. We all know that. Milk and honey. And if there was a smart person among the group, they would have said, hey, there's milk and honey in Egypt too. So what are you going to say to that? Oh, it's a different quality. No, it's okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll settle with this. I'm satisfied. I get enough of it. That's which is the, which is a fact. Egypt had enough milk and honey. In actual in actuality, when they arrived at Canaan, they probably looked around for milk, flowing milk and honey. No, no such thing. So are we deceived by a wrong kind of fantasy in believing in Jesus? And so this, so God says to that argument. And let's turn to Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verse 10. We'll read from verse 9. So that you may, oh, so that you may prolong your days on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land into which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt from which you came. So God is telling them, what's the difference? Okay? Where you used to sow your seed and water it with your foot, like a vegetable garden. What does that mean? And then verse 11, but the land into which you are about to cross to possess it, a land of hills and valleys drinks water from the rain of heaven. A land for which the Lord your God cares, the eyes of the Lord your God are always on it, from the beginning to even to the end of the year. That's the difference. What's the difference? In Egypt, they used to tread water. Right? For irrigation. From which, from where? River Nile. Nile River. And that's why Nile River was considered the mother river. The liver of uh, the liver. River. <laughs> mother, not, not mother liver. Mother river. The river of life. They considered it the river of life. River of money. River of wealth. River of my God. And they, they worshipped the Nile River. Oh, most of the gods their Gentile gods and idols came from the Nile River. You know those things? Frogs and, and gnats, all those things were gods for the Egyptians. God used them to judge them during the plague. You know how funny God is? God, they worshipped idol, cattle and calves, so God killed them with the hail and with boils and, and pestilence. Right? And then God worshipped, and they get they worshipped Pharaoh. Pharaoh's firstborn. Right? So the Nile River, so they had no reason to look up. Their source of life and wealth comes from the from below. Remember, the second day of creation, God created the expanse, divided the waters above and waters below. 
the heavenly, the earthly. They were living and depending and, and, and relying that everything about their life on the waters below. On all the human ways, the world, what the world provides, everything about the world, everything, the worldly ways. But he says, but in Israel, in Canaan, there's no more Nile, Nile River. You have no dependence on the earthly thing. But the water comes from heaven. So where, how do you get the water? Not with your foot, with your prayer. You have to look up. You have to look up. Let us turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. You can still see, right? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. Okay? He's talking about the well water, water from below. But he says, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I, I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And then Jesus also says in John chapter 7, verse 38, 37 and 38, John chapter 7, 37 and 38. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, this, this feast is the day when people were praying for rain. This is the beginning of the harvest season. Beginning of the, wet, uh, the rainy season. And so they're asking God for good rain for the rest of the year. Okay? But we read Deuteronomy. It's the land where God remembers and His eyes are on from the beginning to the end of the year, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why they used to come and, and uh, do all the ceremonies to ask God for rain, good rain, because that's the source of success and prosperity for the land. And on the eighth day, which is the last day, also called the great day, if it actually rains, God provides water, they believe, wow, this year is, you know, Chinese New Year. Uh, not you, but many non-believers go where? Temple or they, they look up something. You know? Yeah, something to, to see, uh, is my year going to be good? Or you know, is it going to be lucky year? Or am I going to win a lottery? Or, you know, they look up those uh, fortune things, right? It's not that, but God, in their, they believe if God gives rain, this year is going to be a successful year. But this particular year, Jesus comes to the temple on that last day and says, whoever is asking for water, come to me. What's Jesus saying? I've been the giver of that water all these years. Okay. He says, I'm the provider of that water. And next chapter, John chapter 8, verse 23. John chapter 8, verse 23. He says, he was saying to them, you are, uh, you are from below, I am from above. So when Jesus says, I give you water, it's the water from above or water from below? Water from above, right? You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And then John chapter 3, verse 12. Jesus says, If I told you earthly things, you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? John chapter 6, 16, verse 12 also, he says, I have many more things to say to you, but you are dull of hearing. And so he is from above, and he says, I am going back to above. And we who have been looking down for help and life, looking at this world for, to reach out for something, some kind of gain, 
Just as they were putting the water from Nile River, God says, promised land. Something different about promised land. It's not, today for us, it's not the matter of necessarily location. It's the matter of your heart. Are you looking downward for the source of life? Or are you looking upward for the source of life? I pray that we may become successful in entering that promised land where we don't have to depend on the Nile River anymore, but depend on the Lord, our God, the Word of Jesus Christ that comes from above, that will bless us, that will continue our life.